Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew and this is episode 73 and we've got a great program lined up for you today with two very contrasting feature interviews. First we're going to Denmark to, to interview the designer Benta Geil who's very well known in Scandinavia for her designs but also for her really beautiful yarn range Geilsk. And Benta has actually done a bachelor's degree in handcraft, which sounds like heaven and is totally enviable. But she's, so she's bringing a lot of uh, knowledge to her designs. And you'll see in the interview that they're very clever designs and they actually come in the full range of 12 sizes, which is fantastic. And our second interview is with Nancy Erlbeck, who is a professor in the Animal Science Department at Washington State University. And Nancy is extremely passionate about sheep and wool production and preserving the rare breeds. It's a super interesting interview because Nancy has a very deep understanding of the relationship between humans and sheep, both from an animal scientist perspective, but also on a really deep personal level. And one of her greatest joys is to teach young people how to work with sheep and how to understand them, which is super cool. Yeah, so the subject of this interview is obviously not really core knitting, but it is really interesting. And Nancy, is totally likeable yeah. so we're sure you're going to enjoy that we're also going to take you to a stunning 13th century welsh castle with amazing views we'll be announcing the winners of our fruity cable and lace cow and we're also going to give you an update on our current projects but we're going to start with bring and brag yes so obviously we're celebrating the completion of andrea's hiking jacket which she is wearing now um, this is a jacket that Andrea designed for herself and I knitted up. It's made in these Jemison and Smith Aran White wool, Shetland wool, obviously, in this beautiful bold blue. The blue is carefully selected to let Andrea be discovered on the top of Mount Snowdon in a snowfall. Snowstorm, in case you get lost. <laughs> exactly. She's wanting to get picked up by the helicopter. Um, I'm not, actually. <laughs> I'm sure she is. We go to Snowdon every year or we go to North Wales for our annual vacation over winter and Mount Snowdon is, is right there. It's the highest mountain in England and Wales. Yeah. And we've been to the top of Snowdon to the summit about six times, I think. And, um, yeah, we love the, the spectacular scenery there. So that's why it's called the Snowdon Hiking Jacket. That's your Snowdon Hiking Jacket. And this is my Snowdon Hiking Jacket, which I knitted, again, based on Andrea's design around two years ago. So I'm really thrilled to have the two of them. Both got zippers? Yes. Um, in the last episode, about two weeks ago, um, you saw that I had completed the body of the jacket and Andrea had actually stitched that together and put in the zip. And you also put in this stunning, if I may, yes. little bit of ribbon here along the side. The ribbon is really cool because it's got, I mean, it's a beautiful blue as well and I like the contrast, yeah. but it's also got really lovely seagulls on it. And that's totally appropriate because at the summit of Mount Snowden, there are always seagulls. I guess we're not that far away from the coast. No, you can see it. Part of the adventure there is that we've got our dog, Jack, with us, and Jack would like to catch the seagulls, yeah. um, which is really scary because Mount Snowden is pretty pointy at the top, and if he ran away, then there's every chance that he would run over the edge of the mountain down the cliff. Yeah. So we hang on to him tight and kind of have a heart attack as he tries <laughs> to run away. People say that uh, poodles are really intelligent, but Jack keeps it very well concealed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very silly dog. Yeah. So in the last couple of weeks, I've finished off the sleeves. So the two sleeves and the exciting bit was as apprentice to Master Nita Andrea, <laughs> I was inducted into the art of backstitching. And I think I did pretty well. You did really well. I didn't find it too difficult. There's, there's yeah. two obvious challenges with most of the things that I do. One is figuring out where to put the needle exactly and being confident about that. And the other one is, of course, tension. Yeah, so Which, at first you weren't pulling the stitch tight enough. Yeah, so yeah. watch the tension. The other thing that I noticed, Andrea has this particular technique. I don't know if it's an Andrea special or an industry standard, but <laughs> after, after a couple of stitches, I have to take the seam and give it a good tug. And my understanding is that that's to make sure that it's not too tight. That it doesn't end up puckering, that you haven't over, over pulled yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, but you're doing super well. I did it. The result is really great, and I love the jacket overall. Yeah, yeah. And I really like the squiggly little cable lines down here. Yeah, that's a wiggle cable, technically. Okay. <laughs> wiggle cable. Yeah. But it's, it still keeps it sporty looking. It yep. looks very sporty, and that's just kind of uh, elegant. Yes. Yeah, it's yep. cool. And I think you did the seams super well, and it's great to have an apprentice who's so good at stocking yeah. stitch and backstitch. I'm a master of stocking stitch and backstitch. You're very useful. 
<laughs> We're on to under construction with me and I'm working on two projects at the moment, which feels pretty odd for me. That's outrageous Andrea. yes the first one I'm going to talk about is Aberdeen by Martin Story and we're actually running a Martin Story knit along right now so you can enter any of Martin's designs whether it be an accessory a garment or a home decor project and we interviewed him in the last episode so you can go back and have a look at that interview for inspiration if you'd like so if you haven't joined in already please feel very welcome to do so it should be a good Carl he's got a ton of designs so I'm doing Aberdeen and it comes from this book here, which is unfortunately no longer in print. It's a Scottish, Scottish Heritage Knits. Here's a picture of my design. And I totally fell in love with it, not just because of the Argyle patterning, which I really love, but because of the amazing color combination, which I really fell in love with. So I want to keep exactly that color combination. But he's designed it for, for the yarn Rowan Fine Tweed, which is no longer available. And I've substituted it with the Rowan Felted Tweed. And miraculously, I've achieved the same gauge, which is amazing. It doesn't it means that I don't have to change any numbers, which is very helpful. So I've tried to pick the colors as close as possible to what he had in the fine tweed. And last episode, I showed you my swatch. Here it is here. And I talked about the dilemma I was having in trying to pick the right colors for the contrasting band. And in the end, and thanks for all of your input, by the way, there was lots of different answers and suggestions. Mm. In the end, I went for the dark red. And I did that because I thought it's going to be enough of a contrast. And it also, I think that heavier look is, is more going to make it more balanced overall. I thought the orange in the end was a little bit too light. And some people, what I was actually really after was a very deep burnt red, like an orangey red. And they just don't have that in the felted tweed color range. And some people were suggesting other substitute yarn brands that did have that color. But the problem is the felted tweed, and I can hold it for now. <laughs> the felted yeah. tweed isn't a pure wool. It's mainly wool, but it also has viscose and alpaca in it. And viscose actually stretches with the natural body heat when you wear it. And alpaca also stretches. So I wanted the band to um, do exactly what the rest of the body was going to do. So that's what I've gone for. And I, I'm pretty happy with that. I think it'll be fine. Now, Martin has written this design to be knitted in pieces, so a separate front and back, and to be done in intarsia. Now, there is a case for it to be done in intarsia because the actual diamond motifs are fairly large and the widest part of a diamond is seven stitches. So you could definitely do it in intarsia. I've decided to do it in the round, as you can see, and I'm stranding it behind. So, so yeah. If you, I was wondering why you... Um why it was written in the flat. I didn't know it was meant to be done in intarsia. But if you switch to doing this stranded, you're carrying your floats across the, the diamonds here, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Which means you're going to use up more wool. Yeah. Have you got enough wool? That is a good point. <laughs> that is a good point. You're not just a pretty face. So this is going to be exciting. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I will quickly phone up Ulrika and tell her to, or ask her to please hold another ball of each colour. But I think I'll probably be fine because what tends to happen, if you've got four or five colours in a garment, then often you've got yarn left over. Yep. So right. I might be fine. But that's a really good point. Yes, I will use up more yarn. Okay, now you've got me off my train of thought, let Sorry. me think. Okay, so I'm doing mine in the round. Now, the most important thing here, like I said, the diamond motive is actually quite big. So it's really important that the full you have a full diamond motive directly in the center of the chest and directly at the center of the back, and then have the other diamond motives mirrored um, equally on either side, on the front and on the back. Now what that's going to mean is that on some sizes, the diamond uh, motifs won't match up at the side seams, but the size is obviously, the fit is more important. And the eye won't really see what's going on underneath a swinging arm, but it will definitely see what's happening center chest and center back. So 
What I've, and my diamonds aren't gonna match properly at the side seams. And here, if you, you can help me now. Yep. Just hold that a second. So what I've done is uh, I've done a, col a fake seam, a column of pearl stitches going up here. And that just stops the pattern crashing violently into each other in the side seams. Don't want that. We don't want that, no. So I'm, I'm quite happy with it. It's going to be a little cropped top, probably sitting to about there. And it's got set in sleeves. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to steek them and continue knitting in the round or if I'll separate and just knit the, the top upper front and upper back flat. The problem is this yarn is not a perfect steeking yarn. It's not 100% wool and wool and spun. So I may end, if I steek, I may end up uh, finishing the steeks with my sewing machine. That is actually less bulky than doing a crochet or, or mm -hmm. some other way. Um, so what I will do is I'll play around on my swatch. I'll sew it up and cut it up and, and see how it behaves. So a swatch is really handy for many, many things. It, it provides you with a fabric that you can really hack and hack around on <laughs> and see how it works without yeah. wrecking your real project. Yeah, so that's project number one. My next project is Sculpted Frost by Linda Marving and I'm using a DK weight yarn called Tinder by the Hillesvog Woolen Mill in Norway. And in my opinion, it's closer to a sports weight yarn or even a fingering weight yarn. But there we go. It's a beautiful yarn. It's got sort of a little halo on it. They say it's a DK, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's recognized as a DK weight. And here is my project. I finished the back. It's looking good and you can see that it's got this beautiful flowery lace panel right down the front of it. So I am actually knitting to a completely different gauge than the pattern and I'm not using the recommended yarn. So I have to work out the, all of the maths and the stitch counts myself. And, and here's a picture of the original design so you can have a look at it. And you can see that it's actually quite long. I'm not going to do mine quite as long as that. Mine's just going to be come down to sort of mid-hip. And, but okay, so I might need your hands now. Yes. So if we have a look, we'll hold it up quite close and you can see. So it's, it's the main uh, body of the pa is, is a big lacy flowery panel. And then you've got two little thin stocking stitch panels on each side. And like I predicted, my armhole shaping just happened here in the stocking stitch panels, which is, is kind of cool because it's much harder to do shaping inside a lace panel and if you actually hold hold it at the top yes and hold it up high and you might be able to see that it's got this really lovely a-line shaping to it which is it just makes it very sort of drapey and flowy it'll be very pretty when it's finished so there we go back is finished and here is the left front which i've already started i've got that much so the design of it is going to have a garter stitch shawl collar. In fact, the garter stitch will start down right at the bottom of it, just have a, a, a smaller panel, and then it'll increase into be a shawl collar. And then you'll also have two small pleats or tucks that'll run sort of parallel up the front and then round behind the collar at the back. And that's all done right at the end. So the next stage that I'm up to is doing the shaping, the neck shaping on the front panel, and it's going to be a very deep V. And like I said, I have to redo all the maths myself because my stitch count and my row count is completely different from the recommended gauge. So what I had to do was at least roughly block my lace because it's impossible to accurately measure you know, lace that hasn't been blocked. And I can tell from the schematic that the, the V shape starts around 10 centimeters below the beginning of the shaping for the armhole. So I had to just block it up completely so I can really measure. And I think I'm ready to start the, the deep V. Mm -hmm. So there we go. That's an update of this project. I think it's going to be very pretty mid uh, season garment. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Coming up now is our interview with Benta Guile. We actually recorded this interview last year in the heat of summer, but yeah. for a few reasons we had to put off um, showing it. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't met Benta Guile before, you're going to love meeting her now. She is hugely likable, down to earth and friendly. 
and her designs are extremely clever. Yeah. She has several designs which are made to be worn in several different ways, which is really interesting. As Andrea mentioned, she covers the full range of 12 sizes, which is great, and the patterns are meticulously written. So enjoy Benta, and we will be back. to Fruity Knitting. We're going to Denmark for this interview and you're going to meet Benta Geil. Benta is well known in Denmark as a designer and as a yarn producer with her brand Geilsk. Her patterns are very popular in Scandinavia and increasingly so in Europe and this is because they combine great craftsmanship with a typically simple Scandinavian style that's fun and quirky. Benta has a masterful knowledge of fitting the female body and has a special focus on the larger lady. Her pattern sizing goes from around a 30 inch bust to a 55 inch bust and that's a total of 12 sizes. And viewers have been asking to see more designs for larger ladies and I think it's cool to be able to feature another Scandinavian knitter, especially one from Denmark. So it's great to have Benta with us today. Benta, thank you so much for giving us your time on the podcast. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here. Okay, so Benta, let's start with you telling us something about the Danish hand knitting culture. For example, who were the major influences of hand knitting in Denmark, say, over the last 50 years? And maybe you could just say what their key contributions were and if and how they may have influenced your designing. Um, as many not know, we have an old lady, she's dead already, but... Um, she is called Oselon Jensen, and she has made um, a huge uh, contribution to make knitting a um, profession in Denmark. Uh, she said, why are we knitting at home and no one is talking about it? We have to knit and call ourselves knitter. So um, she made, um, she made uh, some knitting um, uh, drawings and told people this is how you knit and she teached at a special school in Denmark where you were uh, teached handcraft and um, she she talked a lot about knitting and made knitting known uh, at the uh, art schools and um, at art museums so uh, she is she made it very famous, <laughs> and um, she teached, and was, uh, there she met Mayane Isager. And Isager is one of the main knitting designers in Denmark, too, and she's still living in the northern of Jutland, uh, where the sun is always shining. <laughs> and um, she, she made a lot of designs then, and she makes a lot of designs now. And she has a daughter that takes the, the knitting with her. So she's also a knitting designer. And then we have Vivian Huxbo. Uh, she's about 70. She made an um, instruction knitting book. And then she has uh, made uh, a book about uh, domino knitting. And she has just made a book about old Danish nightshirts. Um, she have looked uh, around in museums where they, she found old shirts and she made the patterns new and made a, a whole book of it where she tells the story. And there are knitting um, techniques in the book. So that is a very good thing to do to, to bring the, the tradition fur further to the new generation. And then we have an, another lady called Hanna Falkenberg, and she's very good of 
um, uh, pointing out what is the Danish knitting tr tradition. It's uh, plain, not that many colors, and uh, it, it's like the Danish um, furniture uh, designs. Uh, you can look at it and see that is Danish or, or that is Scandinavian. So which one of these ladies um, had a bigger influence on you? I think uh, without uh, knowing it, it was Ursula Jensen, actually. Um, I read about her and think, oh, that is why we do that. And that is why I think um, this is how I do it. Um, so it's actually uh, quite nice to know where I got my tradition from. And um, Vivian uh, is very good in doing uh, it to uh, making knitting a joy because she is good in explaining this is how I do it and I call her my knitting mom. So she's the one who really wrote the textbook, the Danish yeah. textbook on, mm. on hand knitting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've also noticed that um, a lot of Scandinavian knitters love to work with really fine yarn. So why is that? Actually, I discussed it with Vivian and she, because she made the nightshirts and she said it's not because we made the nightshirts, uh, it's because then it was also necessary for us to make thin uh, garments that we could have under our jackets. So we work in layers um, uh, and we have always uh, knitted it uh, at needle size three, I think. Three millimeter, yeah. yeah. Last night I'd ask some uh, knitters why are you, uh, why are you knitting on the, the those sticks uh, with three millimeters, and he said, "I have it always on that. Uh, it's uh, it's the best thing to do." And the knitters generally don't mind a project taking longer because it's on such fine yarns. I think, and I, I think others are thinking like me that. Um, when you are knitting, it's not the project. You have to have that uh, special garment uh, done. It's more the knitting in itself, uh, the knitting with the, the special pattern or, or that shape or something. It's, a, it's more about the process than the actually finishing. In, in Denmark, we, we buy wool. We like to work with wool because we have it in a long time. It's, it's not something we just wear and then throw away. We have it for a long time. So when we knit something, we wanted to make fun to knit and then we wanted to be beautiful afterwards. Uh, but it's more the process to, to do it. So Benta, how did you become a knitwear designer? What was your, your training or how did you learn your craft? I have had all my, my, my children and son, uh, one day I said to my husband, I want to be uh, something else. I want to do handcraft. And I want to go to that school, particular school, where you can get the finest uh, bachelor degree. Actually, I got a bachelor degree in, uh, in how to do knitting and sewing and embroidery and um, weaving. Um, and I got... I went there for three years, and it was the most fun time in my life. On a knitting machine, I learned to um, how to shape things without uh, uh, take it off, and then you have to sew it together. You can okay. you can knit, and you can knit in, a, in another round. So that was very good for me. Okay, so you learned all your seamless designing actually on the knitting machine. Yeah. It, it was fun to, to learn how to do it. And I was teach on the knitting machine by another called uh, Lotte Kerr, who was an art designer, something. She was not a, actually a knitting designer, but she loved the knitting machine to shape her art. Okay, so it sounds fascinating to be able to do a full bachelor degree on hand on handcraft. Mm -hmm. So just really quickly, what are a couple of the other things that you that you will uh, taught during this degree or, or even tell us what was your, for your final examinations, what did you have to produce? At, at the school we were teach how to teach other how to do it. So I'm, um, I'm a teacher in handcraft. So uh, I have to uh, make something in my that was uh, handcrafted 
but also tells uh, something about your your mind, how you think when you are doing something. Um, your process. Yeah. yeah. I decided I want to make uh, something in contrast that I wanted to make a dress that was made out of old sweaters, uh, like. Uh, uh, at that time, there was a, a movement, movement called Do Redo, um, do something about your, with your old things. And I, I was very fascinated about that. So I bought a lot of old sweaters and had some old sweaters and had some old sweaters from my ancestors. It was very fun to do a, a dress that was not a sweater, but actually made out of sweaters um, with the... Um, long tail behind and so so benta on your de- on your website you describe your designs as being atypical and humorous and classic and danish how do you bring all of that together so just say something about your aesthetic and your designing strengths atypical it's um why i do atypical is that um i was fascinated about this not sewing together when you're finished it um, have to be one piece. It was not to be uh, front and a back and two sleeves, but th- something else. And uh, when I was wanted to start in another place in the garment, uh, like for instance on the shoulder on the middle, it it will be atypical because you're not used to do it like that. I want to make a raglan in another shape than usually you do raglan. And um, and therefore, I also have many uh, sizes because you cannot always uh, uh, re-math the thing. It's going what's going on in, in the garment. You have to do just like what it says because you cannot figure out which way you are going to knit next. Um, it's not difficult because, uh, but. Uh, some of my knitters says it's actually fun and they learn something when they're doing it. I also say humorous and uh, that is because um, I like to give my, uh, my garments, my, my designs, funny names. It's like your children. It gets a name. And uh, okay. I, I give them funny names because then you remember what it was. The, the Danish, the... the the plain design. I, d- I do, don't do designs with uh, a lot of colors, uh, um, flowers, for example. For, for example, uh, I do uh, garments with plain color or stripes. Um, and we like the, the plain thing in Denmark. I like to knit with uh, ribbing and, um, and small uh, patterns. Okay, so basically the designs are always discreet yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you must have learned a lot of technical knowledge through your degree. So is, would you consider that a big strength in your designing? Absolutely. I, I used to say when I'm teaching, if you know something, you can always build on the top of the knowing what you know. So I know a lot about knitting and techniques and therefore, I'm doing a little extra. I, when I design, I want to, oh, how can I do that? I try to find out how to solve uh, a designing problem because I'm not knitting always from the top and down or down up. So I have to solve some techniques, uh, te- technical problems. And um, because I know what I know, I can use it to put together. And um, I, I used to, to say to people, try and think, what are you actually knitting? And how ca- could you solve that problem? Uh, don't do what you used to. Try to think. Because you actually, you know it. You have done it. But you are not able to do it, uh, to use it right here. But maybe you could. So it sounds like you love to problem solve yeah. and also perhaps you like to um, help other people break their boundaries. Is that right? When yeah. you're teaching people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
So Benta, we want to have a look at some of your yarns. Increasingly designers are bringing out their own yarn labels. So first of all, just tell us why was it important for you to do this? And then maybe just pick a, a few of your yarns and say what the blends are and, and what kinds of projects they're good for. I started uh, 11 years ago. And um, when I went to my uh, bank to borrow some money for the, for the studio and for pre, uh, buying yarn, uh, the the man said, "Oh, I don't think that with the internet and buying on the internet is a very good idea. I I don't think it's it will stay." <laughs> and uh, that was uh, that was what my, uh, some said then. So um, I I thought I wanted to have a web shop, and I wanted to have my yarn uh, yarn and my designs in the stores uh, because that was what we did then today it's uh, the the picture have changed and uh, you can do designing uh, without having your yarn because you have ravelry ravelry in denmark yeah. we say ravelry <laughs> 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 it's because it's um, it doesn't um, uh, do right in our mouth i think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just laugh i know i know we didn't have that then, so uh, it's it is come it came and maybe today I will um, consider not having my own yarn, but I'm actually glad to have my own yarn because it gives my me a certain comfort to I know the yarn I know how to knit with it I know what it will do when I'm I did do a specific pattern. Um, but the yarn I started with was the guy's Tøn Ull, and uh, that is uh, the most common yarn we have in Denmark. It's uh, suitable for needle size 3, and it gives that light, thin garment you, you actually want, a cardigan or a, a scarf or something. It uh, has beautiful blends. Uh, it's a little mixed with uh, other shades in it but it's it's actually just one shade but it looks like a, a little melange i like that very much and that's pure wool is it pure wool and uh, i say hand wash because uh, not all washing machines can can wash it but in denmark we have washing machines that can wash wool i know not everyone have that and then I have the, the the wool blend with cotton in it. It's uh, forty five percent of cotton in it, and then it's it's wool the rest. And those two can be uh, they can do for the same uh, pattern. This one is uh, light like wool, but you can uh, feel that it's it's cotton like. So it gives a very soft garment, and that is very suitable for children and for men that is <laughs> <laughs> they don't like wool it's scratching you know? yeah. <laughs> um, they, they say oh this is just cotton it's, it's nice so uh, buy this <laughs> for him <laughs> and then I have another a yarn that I like very much it's, um, it's actually known as the soft donegal yarn and uh, it has uh, knobs in it we like it very much because it looks like it's a little bit from old times. Yeah. It's just one um, thread or... One, one ply. One ply, but it doesn't... Um, um, oh, okay. It doesn't twist on the bias, you mean. Yeah. yeah. No, that is very good. So I use that for, for men too. And I have done a, a specific men cardigan with uh, zipper. And uh, they are very fond of it. It's called Flottenheimer. It's uh, Flotten is uh, nice and Heimer. It's a, it's a it's a guy that is spending a lot of money. But it's <laughs> it's it sounds like it's a very nice guy. But he is a oh I can buy that and I can buy that and and he hasn't any money. Okay, so that's where your humorous name is. Is yeah. You cannot translate all the names into English. Okay, I actually wanted to ask you another quick um, question about yarn weights because 
Typically in the States, in the UK and Australia, yarn weights are described with names like fingering or sports weight or DK or Aran, together with an accompanying gauge, maybe like 24 stitches to 10 centimetres. And that's really useful if you want to substitute yarns. And sometimes I have trouble if I'm looking at Scandinavian yarns to see what kind of pattern I could use them with, especially if I'm wanting to pick a pattern that's not Scandinavian. So, and because some Scandinavian yarns don't have the, the gauge, they've got something more like the meterage per grams mm. being used. Mm. So what is the most common way of describing and understanding yarn weights in Denmark? We don't use uh, fingering or light fingering. We, I think it's, uh, we say it's suitable knitting on needle size three millimeters or three and a half or four millimeters. And uh, we look a lot of the, the, um, the meters in per 100 grams, actually. And is it more common to buy in kits in Scandinavia? It's more common to buy in kits. You, you buy a pattern together with your yarn. And uh, that is how we have done it always. <laughs> um, but now when the, the internet and the web shops is coming in, it's uh, grown that you just buy the pattern. And uh, we have some books in Denmark that is uh, known as the book that you can knit um, Children's clothes on needle side three. Okay. Uh, and they say, they say uh, you can knit with this and this and this yarn. So um, uh, we are getting more European or US way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of really beautiful Scandinavian yarns. And I just wanted to ask you as well, because um, a, a lot of local yarn stores around the world are really struggling to compete with online shops and your yarns are sold both online and in local yarn stores. So what would be your advice to a local yarn store owner on how to stay relevant and successful? I think they should think that they are um, customers, uh, customer um, likeable. Um, yeah, they have to, 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 to do events that customers will come to and they have to know their customers. It's just not one that comes and buy yarn. You have to be friend, uh, best friend um, with them so they will come again. And um, last night I went to a trip with a boat that was a yarn store keeper that have arranged it for all her customers. Um, it's hard work to, uh, today because you have the internet to compete with you, uh, but you have to do something else you, you cannot get on the web shop, uh, and that is the events, and that is also why a lot of uh, yarn stores in Denmark is arranging the Worldwide Knit in Public Day, because uh, that is uh, the way to get the p customers in, and um, we have a we have a events that is called uh, Knit and Drink, and there was a barkeeper coming, and uh, he is making drinks for them. Yeah, and also um, I suppose even having designs that people can try on and feel would be a good thing. You you do that, don't you? Yeah, in Denmark it's common that you you knit a, a specific garment, a, a pattern, and the people can actually try it on. So they can see, oh, it's not a medium, it's a large, I have to, have to knit. And that uh, gives some comfort to the customers that they have actually seen it knitted. Well, Benta, let's have a look at some of your designs, because I'm sure the viewers are really keen to have a look at them. Actually, this is a very old thing, but it's, um, I wanted to show you an atypical thing. Um, it's... Um, it, it will not only go in pairs, it can be single, but but you can knit two and then you can wear the one like this and you can knit, wear the other one like this. And in Denmark it is called ermeling and that is the same as sleeveling, a little sleeve. And you have a, like a sweater, but it's actually quite warm in here because you have double layer. You can wear it, um, also you can also wear it like this, like a scarf. 
and it's actually constructed. You just uh, you need a long um, ribbing uh, for about this, and then you drop stitches. And when you drop stitches, it will get long because the drop stitches would make the other stitches longer. And then you pick up stitches in the end, and then you knit around, and you get the sleeve. So you have stitches. And then you pick up stitches, and then you knit around, and then you bind off, and then you have your sleeve. So it's actually not that uh, difficult to make. Now I will show you this vest. My husband is a vicar, and I go to church, and when I'm in church, I think about knitting. And, uh, and then I can read his uh, speech when I come home, he says. So that is okay. I knit in the church too. But uh, this particular day, I was thinking about uh, this vest I wanted to knit. Uh, it has drop stitches here, and you can put it together like this. And I will just turn it around. And then it has a beautiful back with the, uh, the triangle. And the triangle is done because you can wear it in a different way. So I will just turn it around. Then you have the triangle here, and in the front you have it like this. So it's a it's a long waist and a short waist, and you can uh, wear it in two different ways. And if you want to make it longer, like um, like this, you have to uh, do something extra rows and then bind off, then you get it longer. But if you want to have it longer the other way, you just nip this longer, then it will all get longer. I can see how you really like to play with different constructions. Mm -hmm. When I'm designing, I'm designing like, oh, I like to knit that shape, or I like to use that technique, and then I knit something. And then I put it on my my doll, and then uh, I say, oh, I have to increase or decrease or something, and then I knit again. And then I write the pattern, and then I knit the thing from the pattern. And uh, maybe I'm adjusting something, but uh, usually it, I'm not writing at first, I'm designing. With my, and that is taking a long time, but I have to know each stitch I'm making uh, because um, I'm, I want to make sure that is, everything is done right when I write the pattern. In this garment, I wanted to make a, a thing that could go around. And then I saw, oh, there's a seam here that when you turn it around, the seam will be shown at the front. So that is not good. So I have to think what to do, what to do. Then I'm actually made a like a cover seam. It's it's a, the seam is hidden in here. That is knitting technique, and that is technique while I because I know that I can do it. I just have to solve the problem. You've got all these techniques in your toolbox, yeah, and you're constantly pulling on them to solve your new construction problems that come yeah, up. Yeah, the, the, uh, Sometimes it's difficult to explain because people are not used to do like that. So they say, uh, you cannot do it. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, I, will, I will make a video or show you how to, or you can call me. Uh, I'm always on the telephone when you call me. <sighs> this is a, a typical... Um, a Danish scarf, I think, because we like to knit in knits and pearls and not that uh, many colors. So this is, this is a knit and pearls uh, pattern, and uh, the scarf is called square root in, in uh, English, but uh, in Danish it's called Greek garnet. And it's uh, one pattern that is repeated, just one square and then two square and three square square and four square and so repeatedly and then in the back it's um, reversed I think it's called um, 
in the back here and then you bind off stitches so that is very nice uh, um, holiday knit because it's the same thing you knit again and again and again i like this scarf a lot and many 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 people have knitted it yeah it's mm -hmm. a very beautiful color yeah. Well, Benta, thank you so much for spending time with us yeah. and showing us your designs. It's been really fun to talk to you and get a feeling of, da of the Danish knitwear and hand knitting mm -hmm. culture. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs>we hope you really enjoyed Benta. We have a yarn store that's about a two minute bike ride from our house and the owner Ulrika who we interviewed way back in episode three loves Benta's yarns and highly recommends them. She carries them in her stores and she also loves to knit Benta's patterns and she loves them because of the Danish aesthetic but also because of the really quirky ways that the garments are constructed and you really don't need to be an advanced knitter to enjoy knitting Benta's patterns because there is a lot of plain knitting in them but you'll just enjoy the different constructions and the way they fit. Benta is offering our patrons a generous 20% discount off everything in her online store. She has a multitude of patterns for women, men and children and the patterns can be bought separately or as a kit together with the recommended yarn. Discount also applies just for her yarn if you'd like to try it out on another project and you'll find everything on her online store or you can buy her patterns at Ravelry. Patrons will get the discount at both places and as always the details are available on the Patreon site. We're happy to announce that we'll be coming to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival again this year. Andrea has been working very hard behind the scenes to organize a lot of small interviews. Yes. So if you're not able to attend the event in person, you can at least look forward to getting a taste of it in the special episode afterwards. Yeah. There is no podcaster lounge at the event this year, but they are organizing for some podcasters to have one slot of 45 minutes to have the chance to do a meet and greet session with their viewers. And that's going to be in the marquee. We've been given a slot on the Saturday from 1.45 until 2.30. Yep. Yep. So we'll be there and we would really love to meet any of you who are watching and know us and would like to come and say hello. We're certainly very open to that. And that's the time that's specially set aside for that. If you're not at the event on the Saturday, but you are there on Thursday or Friday, then we are going to be somewhere around there from one o'clock until two o'clock. Somewhere for, around the marquee. Around the marquee, yeah. We have to keep out of the way from the for the other sessions because some other podcasts will have their sessions, their meet and greet session there. But we'll be somewhere around the entrance there, I think, for the marquee. Yeah. So again, we really welcome you to come and say hello. We'd love to meet you. That's the time we've put aside on both of those days if you want to come up and say hello. So that's 1 to 2 on Thursday and Friday and 145 yeah, 1 to 2.30 on, on the Saturday. So it'd yep. be cool to meet you. Yep. Yeah. So now it's up to talking about or announcing the winners of our cables and lace car. Mm -hmm. And just to recap, this Carl, uh, you had to enter a very large project, either a garment or a shawl or a rug, that had at least 50% of the surface area covered in cables or lace or both. Now the reason for this is that if you are doing a very large project that has a new to you technique or a difficult stitch pattern and you complete the whole project doing that, by the end of it, your knitting will really jump to a new level and you'll never go back again, just simply because of the sheer scale of the project. And that's what we were trying to, we were trying to provide this opportunity for people to really get their teeth stuck into cables or lace. And any person who has studied a musical instrument to a very high level or done sports to a very high level will really know this intimately, that if you're learning something physically, you actually have to do, or you have to repeat that movement thousands and thousands of times for it to go into your subconscious and then become an automatic movement and have flow and ease to it. So 
the, the idea of we, we wanted to provide an opportunity to do a large project and for you to tackle a repetitive stitch thing and for it over the time for you to find it easy and then for your, your knitting to jump to a new level. So I really hope that it happened for quite a few of the, you and you got that result. So I forgot to actually shut the th or lock the thread Didn't at the close end. The gate, dolls. <laughs> at the end of February, so some lucky people got their their uh, garments in after that, but that's totally fine. All of the designs that were put in the finished objects thread are just stunning. A heap of work has gone into them, and you all need to be tremendously congratulated because it's a lot of effort and they look great. Well done, and we'd like to give you all a, a present, but we can't. We have two presents, though, and they're fairly good presents. So prizes. Prizes. <laughs> it's not presents. They can be presents, too. It's prizes, however you want to think about it. And this time, I actually picked one of the winners. So one of them is random number generated, and one of them I've picked. And I picked number 46, who is Matt from California, because he took Nora Gone... Skyger design and adapted it to be a man's cardigan, which I thought was completely brilliant. You can see here a picture of the original design together here with Matt's version. And Matt took out all of the waist shaping decreases and the bust increases, and that gave him a completely straight sided silhouette. And the button band in the original design has a very lovely pico edging, which was too lacy for him. So instead he just used a stretchy bind off. And this is actually a really challenging knit. And I think it's totally wonderful that he had the vision to recreate it to be a man's cardigan. And it looks great. So well done, Matt. Matt, we would like to send you Nora Gon's Knitted Cable Source Book. Now there is a fairly big chance that you will already have it since your project was an advanced Noragon knit. So if you do already have it, we would like to give you instead a $30 gift voucher for the Woolly Thistles online store. So just please let me know which prize you would prefer by personally messaging me on Ravelry. We want to give him the option of two prizes because it's really important to us that we give a prize that the, the winner actually needs or wants. Yeah, yep. that's, that's pretty important. But the second prize goes to a random number generated winner. <laughs> but it also happens to be a man. And that is entry number 49, Biking Bob. And Bob knitted Daydreams in Lace, which is a coat by Brooke Nico, And it certainly fits the cowl requirements because it has an intricate lace pattern all over it. This would have been a tremendous amount of work because Bob used the needle size of US 1, 1, 1 and a half or 2.5 millimeters and he knitted it in a two ply cotton and linen blend. It looks fantastic but it was would have been a heap of work so well done Bob. And we'd like to gift you the Japanese stitch Bible, which has been translated into English by Gail Rome. And Gail Rome, we interviewed her back in episode 25, if you want to go back and, and listen to that. And this is a fantastic book. It's full of intricate and beautiful lace and twisted stitch patterns, so you'll really love it. There is a chance, of course, that you may already have this book. And if that is the case, then again, our default prize is a $30 gift voucher at the Woolly Thistles online store. And Claire does have a range of yarns and kits and books and notions, so you'll definitely find something there that you need or that you like.
There was so much stunning scenery in that hike. I really hope you enjoyed it. Poor Andrew got very sick at the end of that because there was a really cold, chilly wind. And he did have his fingerless mitts on operating the drone, but it didn't save you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now we're up to the least favourite segment in the podcast, and that is the patron speech. So I'll try to make it fast. But back three years ago, when we started Fruity Knitting, we knew then that we wanted to keep the show available for free. We didn't think back then, and we still don't, that the show would survive if we made it a pay-per-view service. However, Fruity Knitting has to be a business because of the amount of work that's involved. I've been working over my capacity now for quite some time. I don't want to burn out. I really need Andrew to join me as soon as possible in a full-time capacity. And that means that we are really dependent on enough of our viewers to choose to pay a small amount on a monthly basis to keep the show going. We want to encourage you to think of an episode of Fruity Knitting to be similar to an edition of a magazine coming out on a monthly basis and to be willing to pay a small amount per month on an ongoing basis. The, the free option is there so that new viewers can discover the podcast and for those who really are on a tight financial budget but that's not the majority of our viewers so if you are a regular viewer we really do need your support as a patron so that we can have a fair income it can be sustainable and we can work at a sustainable rate into the future and I want to thank all of our patrons because it's because of you that the show has been available thank you Yep, so it's time now for our second interview, and that's with Nancy Erlbeck. We're sure you're going to love that, so that's coming up. We'll be back in three weeks' time because we are going to be at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, so we'll see you then. Thanks for being with us today. Bye. Bye. to Fruity Knitting. Nancy Erlbeck is our guest today. Nancy has a PhD in animal nutrition and for most of her career she's been teaching university students all about nutrition, wool and the hands-on skills of raising sheep. She's extremely knowledgeable and passionate about sheep and wool, including all the different sheep breeds and the importance of keeping genetic diversity. And one of her particular interests has been to help establish industries that would support the rare breeds. So this in interview is going to be extremely interesting to all of us who want to increase our appreciation of this amazing fibre, wool, which we really love to work with. But it'll be a very special treat for those of you who either have sheep or dream of having sheep one day. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining us on Fruity Knitting and sharing your expertise with us. No worries. I'm so glad to be here. And thank you, Andrea. Good. So just as a little bit of background, can you tell us how your love affair with sheep developed and also just give us a quick summary of your expertise and, and current activities? Thanks. And uh, yes, it's a story, my love and my passion with sheep and how it came to be. I grew up in Iowa as oldest of eight and uh, I was a pig farmer's daughter is what I always used to say. And we had every animal but sheep. And my father would just would not let us have sheep. And my mother read us the story called Rumpelstiltskin. And ever since I heard that story of Rumpelstiltskin, I just had, maybe it's reincarnation. Maybe uh, something, a seed was planted that uh, I needed to have sheep. And this sense of urgency, I wanted a loom and could never find a loom as a child in Iowa. When I attended university at Iowa State University, I acquired my first degree in animal science and I studied, I took every sheep class that they had. I volunteered for every opportunity working with sheep. I uh, moved on to do my master's there in animal nutrition 
and still working with sheep uh, and helping with some of the sheep production uh, orientations. When I um, traveled to West to the University of Nebraska Lincoln in uh, in Nebraska, I found even more um, that passion for sheep. Uh, it exploded. I became a writer for the Nebraska Sheep Producers. I uh, would leave uh, early, early in the morning, like three and four in the morning, to go to the research center for my work, and they would be lambing, and I would go early so I could help with the lambs. And the building in Nebraska was phenomenal at that time, and I can remember delivering a lamb and um, the guard came through and he said, what are you doing here? I said, I have my sheep, my hand up a sheep's bum delivering a <laughs> lamb. He says, I need to see your ID. I said, if you would like it, it's in my back pocket, but I'm busy right now. And um, moved on. When I left the University of Nebraska Lincoln, I started uh, my career as a college professor at Colorado State University in January of 90. And uh, I found heaven in the classroom. I love my students uh, and uh, started teaching animal nutrition in many different venues. And along the way, I became the consulting nutritionist at the Denver Zoo, uh, working with the exotic animals. Because of that, I went on sabbatical to Australia. Uh, I actually took also at another time 19 19 year olds to Australia uh, on an ag tour. And 19 19 year olds are very challenging, but we visited many sheep properties. So again, that sheep resonance just began building even more in me. In uh, 2002, I took a group of students to New Zealand as a faculty advisor at Lincoln University. And during my free time, when I wasn't in the classroom, I traveled New Zealand, North and South Island, but particularly the South Island. And my passion for sheep was blown up. It, I, I'm, a, I'm not cheap, but I'm frugal. And I've went through a junk shop, a, a thrift store, and found a spinning wheel. And I was in love with this spinning wheel. It was broken, but I was in love with this spinning wheel. So I happened to be 45 kilometers from Ashburton, the Ashford plant. And so I took my broken little spinning wheel down to Ashburton, uh, and it's actually this wheel right here. And I took it, they repaired it for me. Uh, they taught me to use it, they taught me to spin, and I would sit in my uh, flat and practice spinning, watching old American movies. It's, <laughs> it, it's bizarre. Uh, when I left New Zealand to come back to the United States, I had not only this spinning wheel, I had a rigid heddle loom and an HF floor loom. And I, both, I have both of those and still use both of those today. So my passion started to come alive uh, as I returned to the States. I sold my house in Loveland, Colorado. I bought uh, 40 some acres uh, right on the Northern Colorado, Wyoming border. And my sheep farm, Anarum Sheep Company came alive. And with that, uh, bringing the students from the university from my classroom and teaching them um, the hands-on skills that I was taught at my mother and my father's knees. I, I was born with the privilege of learning from animals at a very, very small age. My first counting classes were throwing ears of corn or counting flakes of hay, uh, feeding the animals. And to give that expertise to the student um, for me and for my husband has become a lifetime time calling, because if I don't impart the knowledge that's in my head right now, um, th so much is going to be lost. Yeah. And who will feed the animals when my popula when my generation is gone? Yeah. Well, I do actually want to get onto that topic a little bit later with mm -hmm. you working with your students. But just now, um, currently you have four different sheep breeds that, that you farm. So could you just give us a very quick description of each of those breeds, just particularly about their fleeces. How do their fleeces differ and uh, what are they best suited for and even how they're best sun, spun? I will start with the four, uh, but I want to give a preface because of the rare wool breeds. And I started with the rare root wool breeds uh, working with a mentor. And I originally started wanting only the Caracal and the Lincoln because I wanted rug yarns. But when I started working with my mentor, she said that if I was going to succeed, that I needed to have a wide variety of fleeces. And I started finding other breeds. And one of them was the fine wool breed 
called um, the California Variegated Mutation, the CVM, Ramadel CVM. And they are a fine wool breed, uh, beautiful. They look like little teddy bears, little Ewoks. Uh, they are the only true US breed. They're a composite breed. And um, from that fine wool, we have the garment fibers uh, that are soft next to the skin. And with some merino influence and improving my uh, micron count so that the micron count would become smaller, um, we grew, my sheep grew some absolutely amazing fibers. We shear them once a year, um, trying to accomplish a four inch staple so that my hand spinners, that's what my hand spinners like. Uh, and um, we're very, very successful doing that. But I have to say that growing the fine wool sheep are very challenging because uh, Anytime there is a dietary break, and as a nutrition, I understand diet, but you can see the immediate impact on the animal's fleece, maybe a break, maybe a color change. And so as I manage them, I always shear them right before lambing, because if I don't shear them before lambing, the stress of labor, and any of you who have had a child understand the stress of labor, would cause a break in the fiber. And so we would shear right before lambing uh, to help alleviate that one stress. So I have the fine wools. Um, the other that I'll talk about are the Wenslingdales. And Wenslingdales are the Cadillac of fiber uh, within the sheep world. The lustrous, curly uh, wrinkles, um, incredibly um, picturesque. Uh, loved for tail spinning. These animals are almost royal. Uh, the white of the breed have, they call them the blue cap, and they're very poised, very sophisticated. But the wool is pure joy to spin. The tail spinners, including it uh, in many of the artistic um, yarns, um, I, I can't find any other that um, an artist would like to include within their wools, and it spins up beautifully. Uh, the third that I will talk about are the Lincolns, and the Lincolns are probably, of all of my sheep, are the heart. Uh, they're very bossy. Uh, they push their way around uh, what they want, and you will find that their personality perhaps reflects what their fleece looks like. Okay. This is an example of the bold, uh, broad, strong crimp of a Lincoln fiber. And like their personalities, uh, they have strong personalities. The fiber is very strong. It is heavy in lanolin, but uh, for even outer garments, for uh, rugs, uh, this is probably the strongest fiber and one of the original breeds that I started to work with. The other thing with the Lincolns is uh, the lamb fleeces are iridescent. And I didn't, all of my lamb fleeces are sold, but this is the second cut from one of my young, um, young rams. It still has that metallic luster. Um, I will put my Lincoln lamb fleeces against a Wenslingdale fleece. Uh, the micron is still fairly low soft and it makes amazing fiber. And how can you resist such iridescent metallic colors that come particularly from uh, these dark animals? Yeah. The fourth breed uh, that I will focus on are the Caracals. And the Caracals are a true unique breed. They are thought to be the first domesticated sheep. They're a hair breed. Uh, they are a fat tailed breed, uh, come from the Fertile Crescent, Turkey, Iran, Middle China, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, all of the stands. And you will find that this breed uh, is a desert animal. And because of that, they have the fat tail that where they deposit fat um, like a camel does. But their fiber, and many of them are uh, double coated, was used to make felted, uh, very amazing felting qualities, was used to make the yurts that uh, sheltered these peoples, uh, these nomadic peoples for generation after generation. And the rugs and the fibers still coming out of Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan are uh, pretty, are amazing, are absolutely amazing. And we're working with this breed too as we move into the rug yarns, particularly with the felted rugs. Um, we work with the saddle blanket market because we 
uh, we have weavers that weave the saddle blankets and they uh, put a saddle blanket on an individual animal and with the heat and the motion of the animal, the moisture of the animal, the friction as the animal moves, it's just a natural felting and the saddle blanket becomes a one animal blanket. Um, the, the fiber for rugs is, is amazing. And you've just got a little bit of, of caracal hair there. Can you just hold that up so we can have a quick look? Indeed. This is uh, a caracal fiber It is an, that I just shared this last weekend. It is indicative of uh, the undercoat. And the undercoat, along with the guard hairs and with heat and friction, this becomes felted. It's why we can never blanket our caracals because we you just shear off one little blanket that is the shape of the sheep. Yeah. So the felting uh, is very natural, particularly with this downy undercoat and the guard hairs. I do know that amongst our viewers, we have some small scale sheep farmers who are breeding for wool quality, but we've also got a lot of viewers who are just very passionate and endlessly curious about wool. So I thought it would be really interesting for them to hear um, about a couple of your most interesting discoveries concerning nutrition and wool production. So could you maybe just share a few of those with us? Oh, thank you for asking that. As uh, as a nutritionist uh, and as a professor, I could give uh, several hours lectures on those questions alone. But uh, probably first and most foremost, uh, and my students would laugh if they hear this, is water. Uh, just a simple thing that if you are raising animals in a temperate climate where it freezes, uh, please, please provide them a water source so that they don't have to eat ice, eat snow, of which they will, but that just that heated water, uh, particularly as you go into lambing when the bodies are stressed, if they can have that heated water, uh, not so that it is tempered, it's just uh, below freezing, so that it is liquid and not frozen, uh, is probably first and foremost one of the important things within animal production. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is when I first started, and I'm the animal scientist, you would think that I would know these things, but sometimes we have to learn by doing, uh, going back to the hands-on experience, and is I was so enamored with the fleeces that my animals were growing, I would keep those animals and focusing just on fleece. And what happened is over several uh, couple years is my animals very, very quickly got very from taller, very short, because as you um, select for one trait, uh, you lose everything else. And I have beautiful fleeces, but my confirmation, my mothering started to go. And so I had to step back and say, yes, I'm focusing on the fleeces, but I need to look at the whole animal. I need to look at the body's confirmation. I need to look at the mothering ability. Um, I need to look at their birthing qualities uh, as they give birth. And uh, that has brought me not only good fleeces, but strong, um, strong animals. Okay. So you just mean that you don't only uh, breed for one trait. You, yeah. It might be your main thing, but you, you keep in mind the others as well. Exactly. And you will find examples throughout our animal community. If you intentionally select for one trait, you will have problems. So you need to focus on the whole animal for the animal's health and well-being. The third thing uh, that I would like to focus on is copper. Uh, and another thing, as a nutritionist, I have been taught since I took my first nutrition class, copper in sheep equals death. And what I found with my colored, um, natural colored animals, and particularly with my long wools, my long wools like the Wenslingdale and um, the Lincolns that grow, um, they can grow up to 10 to 15 inches a year. I share them uh, like every eight months. They have a higher requirement for copper. You will not find that in the scientific literature. But what you will see if they are not supplemented higher levels of copper, you will get uh, what we call a chromiotrichia. It is just a banding on the wool, a loss of color. If you go to the science, tyrosine, a non-essential amino acid is converted to melanin. So it makes sense. You need copper for that step to occur. So my long wools and my colored animals need copper. Again, you won't find that in the scientific literature. The third thing is, as a nutritionist, we teach to feed uh, for physiological status. Physiological status, is the animal growing? Is it early pregnant? Is it late pregnant? But by understanding and ultrasounding your ewes so that you know um, who's pregnant when, 
are they carrying singles or multiples and you manage your animals based on the number of lambs and based on where they are during their pregnancy you can actually increase secondary follicles of the animals primary follicle follicles are what uh, they're born with. Uh, they're going to have genetically, you can't mess that up. Uh, secondary follicles are impacted by environment and nutrition is probably the most important part of that um, environment. And if we provide the nutrients uh, 70 to 100 days of pregnancy within that window and then maintain until they lamb at 150 days, they have sufficient nutrients, a well-balanced diet, you will increase the number of secondary follicles, have a more dense fleece uh, to sell uh, to your hand spinners. So maintaining the animal's nutritional needs uh, in utero impacts the fleece on future generations. I find that so interesting. So in other words, just from my lay understanding, the first primary follicles you can't change. That's kind of a given. And but it's you genetic. Can genetic yeah but the secondary ones you can do you can really change depending on when the animal in uterus is fed like the baby is fed at right. what trimester or whatever so and that that will totally change the thickness of a fleece it, uh, the density the more the density of the yeah, fleece okay. and yeah. if you if you overfeed too early the animal's going to get fat and if the animal gets fat, you're going to have birthing issues. Uh, you're go the animal will probably develop pregnancy toxemia and uh, abort those fetuses at an early age because the blood can't get through the fat. So it is very, very important to feed the animals to maintain a uh, thinner, medium uh, body condition until that 70 to 90 day window. And then, then you start feeding to increase those secondary follicles. Wow, that, that's so interesting. <laughs> it is. As a nutritionist, it is. And you've also got, um, you do have a mentoring service, don't you? So um, sheep farmers can come and um, have some calls with you and, and get some advice if they need to, which is fantastic. Uh, I do help those uh, who are wanting to work with sheep, provide that mentoring, um, that consulting service, but it comes from predominantly from those individuals that I sell sheep. Uh, to walk them through those hands-on experiences that they wouldn't be able to learn out of a book. Uh, to answer the question, I have helped delivered lambs in the middle of the night uh, while someone is literally delivering the lamb and I'm laying in my bed on the phone. It's just sometimes you need someone to hold your hand to walk you through that process until you get on your feet. Yeah, you're a you're a sheep midwife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I actually just want to refresh the the viewers on your qualifications because you've done a lot of academic and scientific um, yeah study, and that's all behind your farming practices. So. You've done a degree in animal science, which you told us, and also the PhD in animal nutrition, but you've also worked at the Denver Zoo and you've taught at the Colorado State University and now you teach at the Washington State University. And one of the things you, you get your students to do is to come out to your farm to get a whole lot of hands-on experience. Now, it is obvious that you can't become a really good sheep farmer just through a whole lot of academic and scientific knowledge. But could you give us a concrete example of an experience that you would like your students to have when they come out to you on the farm? Probably the most important um, when I have them come out and they're wanting to work with animals is to know what is normal. Um, because if you know normal behavior and when your animals are calm, if something's wrong, you can pick it up immediately. And so you watch the animals working. Um, you watch them go to the bunk, you watch them eating, you watch them watching you, you watch them chewing your cud. And so if something is off, you develop a sixth sense on what, uh, what, what, what's going on. So I need to take care of, uh, I need to take care of the sheep. Yeah. And you said very, just very briefly, you were talking before about that you've worked a lot with middle-aged women who have, you found, have had a really good connection, particularly perhaps at difficult times in their lives, or you've, they've really made a good emotional connection with the sheep. I think it's because some of us have a calling. 
why, I don't know why. I have had the passion and love of sheep even before I had sheep. And I am finding that the majority of my clients tend to be middle-aged women. And as we go through our lives and many of the changes that challenge us as women, we will find that there are black times. And I have, there's been times in my life when things have not gone well. And I have gone and I have sat with my sheep. And my sheep, there's a love and a trust between my animals and I. They know me and they will come and touch me with their nose and I know that there are several times in my life when indeed uh, it has been the animals that have saved me. And I think that many women, they're seeking something. They're seeking um, to nurture and be nurtured. There's a synergistic uh, relationship uh, between, and they, they know us. Um, sheep have been known to recognize 150 faces. And uh, people that don't I was walking at the National Western Stock Show and I was walking through all these pens of sheep to go up to the top level and all of a sudden I heard this bah! and I'm <laughs> going, I know that bah. And I turned around and there is a big dark gray Lincoln Ram looking straight at me bah! and I said, hello river. And I walked over and it was a ram that I had sold a year and a half earlier to a young woman. and. Um, he knew me. He wanted to say, I know you. Yeah. Um, there's And there's just this connection uh, between men and women, but mostly women in my ex experience. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's a quite moving story just then. Well, it's been really, really fascinating to hear your um, particular expertise in that side of it, of, of wool and fibre. I just want to um, end off the interview now with a little bit going back in history perhaps, maybe you've got a few words, because humans have been living with sheep and other domesticated animals for thousands of years. Can you just say something on how you think that the, this symbiotic relationship first developed? And if there's time, maybe just address a typical vegan concern. That is a good question. Um, the way what I teach in the classroom is the connection between animals and people, humans, is the ancient contract. And if we go back in time, when we went from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic time, from the hunter-gatherer to the agrarian societies, we had, uh, and this is called the midden theory. The midden are the garbage heaps. The first thing that you do when you get up in the morning is you go and do your duty. You urinate and you defecate. And in these old societies, we probably had a place to go do that. Those were called the middens. And you can, I have my students close their eyes and envision you go in and do your duty. And there's maybe a little wild dog watching you. And the little wild dog is wanting to eat your morning business. Mm. And um, every morning you come out, uh, you talk to that little dog. You notice that it's there. You're not threatened. It's small. And um, every morning you start talking more. And then maybe you bring a bit of food for the dog. And eventually that dog is maybe uh, right there on your spot waiting for you. And maybe it follows you home. And this is how domestication occurred. Dog moved into our house. Uh, dog protected us. This is part of the ancient contract. Uh, this is the love um, The we take care of animal, we provide your needs. I, The animal gives back love and trust and protection. We see that uh, even within the guardian animals uh, on my flock, the connection between the sheep and the guardian animals and between the humans and uh, the animals. There is a connection, um, that ancient contract that can't be denied. And what I see happening now is the claim of we are, those of us who raise sheep are cruel to my animals. There is nothing further from the truth. Um, if I have a stressed animal that has been abused, uh, that not only destroys my psyche, I break that ancient contract. The, and you will not find any good shepherdess uh, that doesn't have a deep emotional attachment to the animal. And when there is a trust, I'll tell you one more story. 
I was in the barn and one of my little ewes was ready to give birth. It was her first lamb and she was hurting and she came up. She, I came into the barn. She came up to me, ma, 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 and she ran up against me and ma, ma, and she's in deep, deep labor. And I go, Mooney, it's going to be okay. Ma, 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 and she lays down and gives birth to her lamb and she starts getting up to the lamb and there's this nurturing deep connection between that you and I and if that's abuse I don't know yeah I'm such a silk I I get tears in my eyes when I hear these stories but um yeah yeah I think that's lovely I think I think it's very very interesting and I really so appreciate you taking the time to Um, come and and share your knowledge with us on on Fruity Knitting. It's been a real treasure. Thank you for asking. I'm honoured. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to the audience now. Bye. Bye. Bye.